You're listening to the Crystal Clarity Podcast. So welcome to today's episode, which is all about stones being alive. And if you're somebody who has felt the presence of a stone and thought, I feel like this giant boulder is alive, or I feel like this incredible crystal feels alive. I feel like I'm in the presence of something. Today's episode is about why you might feel that way according to the evolutionary process that the stones are in. And I think that it will help you kind of wrap your arms around the truth that stones are living, evolving, conscious beings with extra dimensional origins. I was walking in the woods this past weekend in Pisgah Forest in North Carolina. And there's these giant, giant boulders protruding onto the trail with with water trickling down them and that incredible smell of fresh air. And these boulders were so, they just kept coming. We just kept walking. These massive boulders are sticking out. You know, it's like looking at the, the side of a mountain. It's like being right next to a mountain. And I'm thinking how incredible it is that the whole body of the earth is rock it's rock and water. You know, we have tons of rock in this world and where did it come from? And, you know, what's its story? What is it doing here? And why do I feel like I'm in the presence of something alive when I walk past this? Why do I feel like I kind of want to bow at this stone? And even the people that I was with, um, who aren't particularly into stones or anything, they were like, wow, you know, they could feel something powerful coming out of these stones. And, and I, I did, I get this feeling like I want to say hello. I want to touch it. Like there's something alive. So that's what this episode's about. And I also want to tell you a little bit about diamond and its place in the story of evolution and a little bit about the first stone acupuncture needles. And let's dive into the story about the alive conscious nature of stones and their origins. I'll see you inside. Welcome to the Crystal Clarity Podcast. It's time to settle in once again with the stones. Together, we'll illuminate stones in healing and spiritual alchemy, and then go beyond, exploring land healing, earth grids, sacred sites, and all rocks in the wild. My name is Sarah Thomas. I'm a healer, educator, and an expert in the field of ancient stone medicine and future crystal technologies that heal and awaken. All right, let's relax into some crystal clarity. Well, this is a cool episode and I am glad that you're here. Listen, if you ever want to take a full stone medicine training, you can take full stone medicine and crystal healing trainings at upperclarity.com. And we have free live events and free live online classes. And then we have classes where if you want to get more in depth and more involved and really tune into what is important for you in your life with healing or alchemy or awakening, we have classes like that too. Right now, as I'm speaking, we have a registration sign up going on for a free class. We do a free awesome stone medicine class about three times a year. And one of those is coming up right now. It's actually called the secret life of gold. And so make sure that you're on our email list so that you get told about the free classes that come up, the small classes that come up, the big classes, and you can always jump into a stone medicine training that feels right for you and that comes up when you need it. So, you know, there's things that just sometimes need to happen and then you kind of find the right educational piece in that moment. So make sure you sign up at upperclarity.com to sign up for classes. So you are in the loop with us. Okay. So, you know, today's episode is all about evolution and it's all about where minerals came from. And it's all about, you know, where were they born? What the heck are they doing here? And how does all of this relate to healing and awakening? How does it relate to us what is, you know, and, and how does this actually contribute to the knowledge that we are learning and the knowledge that we're accumulating so that we can keep evolving ourselves? And the, the beautiful thing about this episode is that you're going to just see, wow, this is how <laughs> minerals and stones evolved. So, you know, the first thing that I'm going to say is that acupuncture needles, 
the first acupuncture needles were not stainless steel needles made in an acupuncture needle factory, right? They didn't have those. They used little pieces of obsidian, little pieces of flint, little pieces of tourmaline. Tourmaline was a stone that could really provoke electricity and had a good connection to electricity. So they said, let's use that. We used opal. There was stones in the past that were used for acupuncture needles. And it wasn't just because they were little, sharp, hard things that weren't going to disintegrate or dry out or bend like an herb or a plant might. There was another reason. It was because ancient Taoists saw stones as alive. They saw them as alive, evolving, conscious beings, just like us. They saw them as alive, conscious, evolving beings, just like us. Now, how we see the world depends on our level of consciousness. And the higher a level of consciousness that we're living in, kind of the more lucid we are and the greater perspective that we have. Consciousness is a funny thing. It's, it's almost impossible to explain. But those are some ways of looking at it. And these ancient masters had a high level of consciousness. Um, so did people in ancient Egypt and ancient Tibet. And if you look at these old records of where people are, ancient Peru, ancient North America, they also saw stones as living things. The ancient North American people, the indigenous people call stones, you know, the, the, the stone people right? And ancient Egyptian practices had all kind of work that they were doing with stone and granite and looking at different principles and stones that made them alive. And so seeing stones as alive, conscious, living things is something that goes back to highly evolved wisdom traditions really on this earth. So it's not so much just kind of a story that they were making up. But I want to talk about stones as living beings as acupuncture needles, the reason that they did that, like let's provoke chi on the body and, and, and really help people kind of awaken and shift not just their physical health, but their consciousness with stones is because these stones were seen as evolving. They were evolving living things. And they said, you know, if these are evolving living things, we should work with these evolving living things that go through these long, deep cycles of time to live and evolve. And so it's like stones almost had a higher, greater consciousness to them, you know, if they could see into their world and gain their perspective because stones lived on these incredibly long, deep time, deep space cycles of time. So that's a greater perspective, right? A greater perspective is usually connected to higher consciousness. And they said, if this thing is living and evolving of this great spaces and cycles of time, there's this incredible evolutionary processes that are, that are so much like grander than our own. They would resonate to helping us to evolve and transform and gain higher consciousness. They would resonate to us evolving and transforming and gaining higher consciousness. So that is one reason why they actually use stones as acupuncture needles. It wasn't just because they were little and sharp. So the relationship between stones and humanity in this kind of like symbiotic process of awakening together goes back a long, long way. I think about evolution as being defined by a couple of different terms. You know, what is evolution? Evolution is essentially, we could essentially say that evolution is is to get born. So you have to get born. You have to come about. It's something that gets birthed or born. It has an origin story. It comes about like there's a moment of birth. It then goes along this process of transforming and changing and incorporating information around it, incorporating relationship with other living things around it. So it goes through these processes of transformation and often in evolution we gain more complexity as we evolve if you look at animals and bugs and all these things we actually gain more complexity as we evolve so we're able to do more things we're able to understand more things we're able to have more ongoing internal processes we're able to um, gain different (coughs) kind of sets of beings sorry for the coughing and transform. So it's like the transformation also is like a proliferation or a blooming. 
And then another aspect of evolution is that something may die. Like there's a possibility for this thing to die and it comes to the end of the cycle. So evolution is essentially a cycle. So it has to come to the end of the cycle and die. And another interesting way to characterize evolution is to think about that something can also come back and, uh, you know, it, that's a process too. It can die and then it can actually come back. So, you know, it wasn't just dinosaurs that got extinct, right? It's just what we think of when we think of extinction. We think of dinosaurs or we think of, um, you know, animal species getting extinct, going away. Uh, we've seen animal species come back actually. And there are some really promising <clears throat> things happening where we're actually starting to be able to kind of go back in time and bring back things that have been extinct and certain processes are able to bring back things that are extinct by kind of working with different timelines. Nonetheless, if we look at something like not just dinosaurs or plant species going extinct, we see that stones can also go extinct. One example of that is on Venus. There is this great greenhouse gas effect going on and that probably caused a mass extinction of minerals on Venus when that happened because the conditions were not right for so many minerals to live under these incredible greenhouse gas effects going on in the atmosphere. Now if the conditions got right again there might be a whole revival of these minerals and these minerals could come back but that's just one example of how minerals could die and then minerals could come back. Minerals, if we look at this whole definition of evolution, minerals also get born. We're going to talk about that today. They go through all these transformational stages and processes. Um, they transform, they relate to their environment, they evolve, right? They change, they become more complex, and then they sometimes die. They end their life cycle. Um, these cycles are very long cycles of life for a mineral but they kind of check all these boxes of evolution. So if you're comfortable kind of being like, okay, yeah, minerals evolve. And I think by the end of the episode, you'll, you'll get there even more because we're going to talk about it a little bit more. I want to let you know that for me, evolution and consciousness are directly correlated. So what evolves has consciousness and what has consciousness evolves. They're very connected. And consciousness is really anything that's kind of spiraling towards in the cyclical state of how everything works in these cycles. It's spiraling towards these greater and greater, greater, and greater stages of life awakening until it kind of realizes all of who it is. It's this process of realizing who we are until we realize all of who we are. Consciousness is always evolving consciousness, the definition of consciousness is that it's becoming, right? It's always becoming. It's moving in that spiral all the time, up and up and up. So consciousness is evolving and anything that evolves has consciousness. So this is my postulation. So the ancient people were saying stones are living and alive and I'm talking about evolution and consciousness being highly linked now. So stones may be these living, breathing, conscious, alive beings that are going through their own process of evolution. And that's actually exactly what I think that they are. I think they don't speak the same exact language as us and they come from a different <laughs> situation. They come from a different life experience. And so much of what we do all the time is just like, how do we link those two life experiences and understand them? And they continue to understand us. But I think that stones are living, evolved, conscious beings based in these principles. Can I take you back? I just want to take you back a minute to where stones actually came from and minerals actually came from. Back in the early stages of the universe, there were just gases. There was just hydrogen, helium, and lithium floating around in these super hot gaseous stages. As things started to cool off, there was some coalescing that happened. And that coalescing made stars possible. So when stars became possible through cooling and coalescing, then some heavier elements were created like nitrogen, carbon, 
silicone got created at that time and these heavier elements and these stars kind of all became possible through that cooling process and as these heavier elements and stars were starting to get born that's when minerals started to get born minerals were birthed at this moment that stars were getting birth and cooling off and cosmic rocks basically are meteorites when they come to earth we've been able to read inside the meteorite how this happened how these elements were formed so they're right the record keepers stones are always the record keepers they always have the story they always have the ancient text and meteorites are the ones that come and tell us what happened in the ancient universe pre-solar system pre-earth now that there are hydrogen helium and lithium plus some heavier elements we have some minerals starting to form and the first mineral that formed is diamond diamond formed first as far as we can tell looking into our rocks and looking into the past as scientists are doing diamond was able to take on this carbon right was able to take on this little crystal structure and have this chemical composition so you need a crystal structure and a chemical composition to have a mineral so diamonds are the original mineral if anybody asks you for some knowledge sometimes say did you know diamonds are the original mineral they are actually predate the solar system they're the first mineral that was likely ever formed so then what started to form is some rutile some titanium based minerals so these are all the ancient grandmas i mean diamond is the ancient ancient grandfather mineral right these other ancient ones come about some corundum some ruby some sapphire some graphites you know some other carbon-based minerals and these are all still pre-earth and pre-solar system stars are there minerals came from the stars and then these minerals evolved a little bit right and then they seeded the actual solar system they seeded the solar system and created the earth essentially they created this big giant rock body that we're on and now we are sitting on this big giant rock body and so that big giant rock body when that came together there was all of the stuff that happened that started to to born more minerals it started to birth more minerals and, and if you think of the earth trying to form the earth is it's dense it's got these heavier elements in it it's trying to form volcanoes are going off creating land there's plate tectonics starting to happen. There's a whole like no negotiation of the earth coming into form. And this is when a lot of minerals were born. You know, plates crushing, deep inner pressure. There's volcanoes going off. All the basalt is getting formed. All these fires are starting to happen, like hot magma that creates minerals. And in this planetary accretion phase, there's, there's essentially three phases that happened from there that were giant mineral growers. They were giant mineral incubators, birthplaces. One of them was basically the earth coming into a blob, coming into form. We were just talking about volcanoes, plate tectonics, minerals like calcite, magnetite, and peridot were formed in those very early stages. And if, if you simplify this into three phases, because it's, it's a, big ongoing evolutionary process of how all 6,000 mineral species got formed. But if we simplify it, the second stage was around, you know, a reworking of the earth's crust, like the mantle being formed. This is where mica and obsidian and moonstone and amazonite came in. It's like the, the earth's crust was starting to really come together and form. And then the third stage would be called biological influences. And biological influences are life influences. So here we have oxidation. There was a great oxidation event where we got an atmosphere that filled up with oxygen and we got water. And that created a lot of minerals. Oh boy, oxygen and water created a lot, a lot of minerals. So these are life processes that went on <laughs> and just like, the, it was just such fertile ground for so many more minerals to form. 
So think of all these minerals, they're being born, right? This is a part of evolution is that you get born and it's all in relationship to all of these other processes going on. It's all in relationship, especially in that third phase, to all of these other life processes going on. In fact, two thirds of minerals owe their life to other life. They owe their life to water over two thirds. They owe their life to things that we consider life processes like oxygen, water, the bodies of other things like exoskeletons, coral, shells, um, you know, bacteria, amoebas, all these little life processes that were gaining complexity, minerals formed from those life processes. Two thirds of minerals. I mean, so minerals, like the life of rocks is really highly dependent on other life. There's this beautiful interdependence of how they came about and how they live and how they're here. And I feel like that's another great marker for consciousness to be so related to all other consciousness, to be so related to life. How could you be so connected to life and a part of life and not be life or not be alive? It's just, to me, it's just, looking at the origin story of stones, it's like it's irrefutable evidence that they're alive. It's all of biological processes and all of this interdependence created two thirds of the minerals that are here. So it's kind of that in breath and out breath, that relationship that life is breathing life into me and I'm breathing life into other life. Like that's really the definition of consciousness. Relationship is life, you know? How could stones be a part of that and not be alive? So this story goes on of stones evolving and we even make stones with our bodies. I mean, minerals get born from our bodies. Biomineralization is us creating calcite in our pineal glands. It's a special form of calcite that we create. We actually create a mineral when we have a kidney stone. We, cr we create something with chemical composition and crystal structure when we have a kidney stone. So our bodies create minerals now. I mean, like so dependent, right, on this, this life. It's like minerals are kind of like climbing this ladder of like the evolution of life, of, of gaining more complexity, of like being part of everything else, just like we are. And we've created all kind of minerals from mining, you know, when humanity does certain processes in the earth to mine, all of these minerals get created from that, new minerals. We've created how many? 234 minerals have actually been born by coal mine fires. So when there's a fire in a coal mine, that introduction of that heat has created new minerals. So it's the interdependence, the connection between us and the evolution of minerals is evident and how the earth is evolving. You know, the earth is always changing, evolving. The climate's changing. The atmosphere is changing. The plates are still shifting. And all of that is just a part of, of mineral evolution. It's like we cannot separate the evolution of the earth, the evolution of stones and crystals, and the evolution of us. We're all interdependent. Something cool about diamond that I wanted to share a little bit today is that diamond can be formed in nine different ways which is really high. You know, some minerals can be formed in two or three ways or birthed in four or five ways. Nine is really high for a mineral. So diamond can be birthed in nine different ways. Like a diamond can come into being in nine different ways. One of them is when I was talking about those very early processes when there was just lithium, helium, and hydrogen, and then some of the stars started to coalesce and some of the heavier elements started to come in. And that's where diamond crystallized. So it can still be being crystallized out there where things are cooling and coalescing in places in the universe. The diamonds can also be formed. What we commonly think about a diamond being formed is when there's such intense pressure inside the earth, like just smashing and place crushing inside the earth, diamonds can be formed under that intense hot pressure. Diamonds can also be formed by meteoric impact. We found diamonds that were born at the moment of meteoric impact. And there are six more ways that diamonds can be formed. So when you think of diamond, 
I want you to think of it as like the original mineral, the oldest, oldest mineral that really ever was born. And I also want you to think of all, it has a very high number of ways that it can be born. Um, nine different ways. That's a lot. I just paused because I was thinking of carbon in homeopathy is highly related to our birth. The moment that we realize we're an individual, the moment that we're like, ah, I'm individuated. This may happen to you in the womb, right? It may happen to you in year one. You may be conscious of it or not conscious of it. But the moment you realize your individual is, you know, treated homeopathically with carbon. And so that just struck me right now. I was talking, I was like, you know, all of these birth stories of diamond, nine different birth stories. Um, and the fact that it's kind of like the first mineral ever born, number one. I would start thinking about diamond in relationship to birth traumas, birth stories, programs related to birth, a mother going through birth processes, um, anything that we know about what we absorbed at birth, what we went through at birth, um, anything about birthing something, getting something born. Diamond has a lot of resonance with that. There's a lot of different ways to look at that. And just to make sure you know, I want to bring pyrite in really quickly because pyrite is the stone that has actually been born the most ways. Pyrite has been born 21 different ways. So <laughs> that blows the other ones kind of out of the water. Pyrite can be formed, born, birthed in 21 different ways. So it's not the oldest mineral like diamond, but it has great versatility in how it can be born. It has great versatility in how it can come into form. Our pyrites are really incredible stone for healers and awakeners, and hopefully we'll talk more about it soon. So stones, my friends, are extraterrestrials. They have extraterrestrial origins, and they have extraterrestrial ancestors. You know, their ancestors are those very first minerals, diamond, sapphire, rudal, which is like titanium stones, and then moving into slowly into silica and graphite stones. These are their ancestors and they were all happening pre-earth. They seeded the solar system. You know, that's what allowed rock bodies to form. It's all the rocks that we're standing on. This earth is like 99% rocks, you know? Well, it's a lot of water too. There's a lot of water on earth and there's a lot of rocks on earth. And then the plant kingdom and the tree kingdom is almost just like a fine little layer of like hairs, like the little hairs that you can feel on your face. Um, so we live on this rock and it's cool to understand like, where did these come from? And it, it's even more important, I think, to, to get a sense of not just that they're extraterrestrials and they come from other worlds and they predate earth, but that they're alive, that they're going through these alchemical processes. They're born, they change, they transform, they incorporate information, they relate to the rest of us, they relate to other living things. And then they can die. They can come to the end of their life cycle and they're all in this great cyclical nature of evolution with us. And I think that's why, you know, when we're in the presence of a big stone or we're in the presence of a really just, I'm holding up a stone for those of you that are listening. If we're in the presence of just something that we feel the frequency and we feel the potency and we're feeling like this feels alive. This feels like I'm in the presence of something that's really a living thing. I think that's true. I think that the origin stories of minerals point to it. I think that evolution and consciousness points to it. And I think that oneness points to it, that we're all here on the same earth. We're all here. Um, you know, coming from these star origins, we're all changing and we're all going through this great cycle together and we're interdependent. It's like we're all part of this great, incredible symphony that is perfect. And absolutely the stones are a part of that. And absolutely then they would assist us in our own healing and awakening and evolution. So thank you so much for coming today. And I am excited that we got to talk about the living, conscious, extraterrestrial origins of our beautiful stone people. 
See you next time. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you liked today's episode, please like or subscribe. Oh, and leave me a comment. I'd love to know what you'd like to learn more about. To take the perfect stone medicine or crystal healing training for you, or to visit me at our super special crystal shop, go to upperclarity.com.